Happy Sabbath, church family. It is a pleasure to be able to virtually worship with you guys this morning. I hope everybody's week has been full of hope and moments of happiness despite this physical isolation we all may be experiencing. And I hope that this morning um, we'll be able to hear your voices from wherever we are and that we'll be able to worship in God's name together. And so I ask that as we continue to sing our next song, please join us in singing. This is Amazing Grace. <clears throat> Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free, oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? back into order 
who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Faithfulness is something that comes from a place of trust and loyalty. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is a confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. While we're praying and longing after God each day to make us faithful, to keep us faithful, Join our voices together so that we can sing about the faithfulness of God. Hymn number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest. Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me pardon for 
sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me Amen. Praise the Lord for his faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. And so on this Sabbath day, as we welcome you to our online service, I want to thank the praise team for reminding us of the faithfulness of God, that his mercies are new every morning. And even today, even now, we are experiencing the blessed love and grace and mercy of God. Let's pray as we begin our time together. Our precious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness, the long-suffering, the loving-kindness of our wonderful, merciful Savior. Thank you for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on our behalf, and that it is because of him that we find ourselves standing today in his grace. I pray, Father, today that as we spend this time together exploring your word, that your spirit would be our teacher that you would guide and comfort our souls, that you would give us a word in due season during this time of confusion and darkness. And also, Father, I pray that you would allow us to be the reciprocators of your love, not only to you, but to those around us, that, Lord, we would truly be agents of healing and mercy in this world. And so, Lord, I pray today that you would be with us now, those who are joining us online, those who will join us um, shortly. I pray, Father, that you would be with every heart as we open your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Greetings again to each and every one of you watching online. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and happy Sabbath. So our title today for today's sermon is called The Wounded Healer. And I'm going to start by asking a very simple question. Um, how many of you have a scar or two on your body? How many of you have experienced those scars? Oh, I see you raising your hand. Just kidding. But I know that some of you, um, if not most of you, if not all of you, have one sort of a scar or another. So imagine with me a little girl is going into the pre-operating room. And the surgeon walks in to describe to her um, that she is going to be um, about to be wheeled in for open heart surgery. And this little girl is understandably very nervous about the experience. And, and the doctor can see the fear in her eyes. And, he, and he, the surgeon um, kneels in front of her. And she says, I'm scared because I don't want to be cut open. And the doctor says to her, Oh, well, you have nothing to be afraid of that it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt 
but she still says, well, the last time I, I got cut open, it hurt really bad. And, and, and the, the little girl then reveals to the doctor a scar on her knee where she had fallen off her bike. And the doctor says to her, oh, wow, that, that scar is, a, is really big. Tell me the story. And the girl begins to describe the story of, of how she fell off of her bike. And the doctor says to her, well, you know, I have a scar as well. Let me show it to you. And the doctor pulls down the front of his shirt to reveal a four-inch scar going down his chest. And he said, I have also had the surgery you're about to have. And this scar here is to show you that I survived and I'm doing just fine. You see, scars, every scar that we have carries with it a story. I'm sure that you could probably tell a story for each scar that you have on your body. I have a scar uh, on my forehead right here. I don't know if you could see it or not, if we have enough HD, but I remember when I was um, a young child sliding across the kitchen floor in our apartment in New York City and slipping and hitting my head on the bottom corner of our refrigerator and, and opening up a big gash over the top of my uh, on my hairline and I remember we had a babysitter at the time and, and I remember I don't know how old I was but I remember her holding me in her arms with a big ice cube in the in the in the open wound and looking out the apartment window waiting for my mother to pull up in her station wagon and, and I don't remember too much but I do remember lying down in the back of the station wagon um, these were the days before you know, we wore seat belts and we could just slide around in the back of the seat of a station wagon. And I remember rushing to the hospital. I don't remember much else, but I do remember carrying that scar and having a story to tell every time someone asked me about the scar on my head. I'm sure you have those stories as well. And so really scars not only are stories, but scars are also marks of, of victory. Um, essentially what a scar is, it's a sign that, that your body has won a victory over the wound. And that while the scar remains there, what we see is that the scar tissue is often stronger than what was there originally, as, as your body uh, did the work of healing and of, and of fortifying that area from future wounds. So, so scars are stories, scars are signs of victory. But scars can also be signs of our identity as well. Um, just imagine with me in, in some dystopian future in which someone takes your DNA and is able to perfectly clone you. And that, that, that clone is walking around pretending to be you, stealing your identity. And when you stand before the judge and say, no, I am really me, that person says, I am really me. Some of the, something that you will have to identify yourself against that imposter will be your scar because that person will not be able to replicate that scar. And so in some ways, our scars even identify us to the world in good ways and sometimes not so good ways. And so today we're going to talk about a wounding experience that one of the disciples had. And how the scars that were left from that experience tell a story to us today about who we are and our identity. So I'd like us to turn in, in the... In Thank you for letting me know that I muted. I don't know how um, that got muted, but I think you guys can hear me now. I think I may have pressed the button by accident, but I'm sure you were reading along with me. 
So I'll read it again just in your hearing. It says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. And Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And so essentially what we have here is the the end of Jesus's earthly ministry. This is the last chapter of the Gospels. And then we have the beginning of Peter's earthly public ministry. It's almost like the passing of a baton where Jesus is saying to Peter, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs. Now, what's interesting here is that the context of this passing on of a baton is not some grand ceremony in front of an entire congregation of disciples in which Jesus anoints Peter as an apostle. As a matter of fact, this passing on of the baton is taking place in the midst of of an experience of Peter in which he is completely discouraged in his relationship with Jesus. If we actually take a look at the experience leading up to this anointing or this passing of the baton, what we're going to find is a series of self-inflicted wounds that Peter had yet to recover from. And so Peter is not in front of a grand congregation being honored, you know, with a scepter, He's not being ordained in front of a a large group of disciples or would-be apostles. Instead, Peter is alone with Jesus, walking on the seashore with his head down and his heart broken. And so what we see here is Jesus is a wounded healer who is now passing on to Peter the responsibility of also becoming a wounded healer for the world. How is it that Peter was a wounded healer? We know that Jesus was a wounded healer because he actually had the scars to show it. He had already died and risen again, and we know that Jesus had experienced the wounding and the breaking of his heart, the burden of sin for the salvation of humanity. But how is it that Peter was wounded? All we see in this in the last days of Jesus's life, the last hours of his life, is Peter denying that he even knew Jesus, running away when when trouble came. And so what was it, the wounds that Peter experienced? Well, if we look at the scripture, we see that the wounds that Peter experienced were to a large degree self-inflicted wounds. Let's take a walk with the disciples through the last hours of Jesus's life, and let's take this journey to Gethsemane. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 30, the Bible says, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And essentially, the, just, just imagine with me, this is, this is the night of the Last Supper. So Jesus had just washed his disciples' feet. They had just spent that time together around the table. And now Jesus said, let's get up and let's take a walk, a, you know, a, a digestive walk up to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the Mount of Olives. Now, as they were walking after that that time, that Passover meal, the Bible says that Jesus was troubled and that he said to his disciples that he was deeply troubled. And the disciples could even see on the face of Jesus that he was being weighed down with a great and terrible burden and it was even changing his countenance it was changing his face and they were also concerned just looking at Jesus about what his what his experience was now listen to what Jesus says in verse 31 of Matthew chapter 26 it says then Jesus told them this very night you will all fall away on account of me For it is written, 
I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And so here we see Jesus distraught because of the burden of sin. And then he turns to his disciples and he tells them part of his burden is the fact that the people who he calls closest to him will be scattered and will, 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 will fall away, run away because of him. And then Peter responds, and he says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. But Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the disciples said the same. And so here we have Jesus basically saying to his disciples that you are going to run away. When the, when the, when the crisis comes, you won't be there. And Peter stands up and Peter is offended by what Jesus tells him about himself. And he says to Jesus, even if everybody leaves you, I will not forsake you. Not only that, but Peter says to Jesus, I will die with you before I abandon you. And I'd like to suggest that we are like Peter in three ways. And, and these are some of the ways in which we are like Peter. One of the first ways in which we are like Peter is that we all begin with misconceptions about ourselves. So Peter's path to healing had to begin with the realization that he wasn't who he thought he was. Each and every one of us, when we begin our relationship with God, when we enter into the communion, the fellowship of fellow believers, when we give ourselves over to this cause or to this mission, we carry with us certain ideas, certain visions about what our relationship with God will be like, about the kind of person that we are. But what, what we see here with Peter is that Peter had a grand misconception about how he would act when the time of crisis came. Peter assumed about himself that even if everyone else denies and forsakes and abandons Jesus, he assumed that he was strong enough to stay the course even when things got hard. So Peter began with misconceptions, not only about who he was, but he also had misconceptions about who Jesus was. He never would have imagined that Jesus would just give himself over to his enemies. That's why Peter carried the sword and felt justified in attacking and cutting off the ear of the Roman soldier because he had a certain concept about what Jesus was. Not only that, but it revealed that he had a certain misconception about the role of the kingdom of heaven, about what the kingdom of heaven was really all about. He assumed that the kingdom of heaven must be one in which there is, that which is enforced, which is expanded through power. When the truth was actually the very opposite, where the kingdom of heaven was expanded through sacrifice. And so here we see that Peter begins with misconceptions, A, about who he is. He has misconceptions about who Jesus is. And he has misconceptions about the kingdom of heaven at large, about the role of the kingdom of heaven. And I'd like to suggest to us today that we are like Peter in that all, each and every one of us has blind spots. We all have blind spots as it relates to who we are. We all have blind spots as it relates to who Jesus is, and we all have blind spots as it relates to the work of God's kingdom, what it means to be advancing or expanding God's kingdom here on earth. And we all carry those misconceptions with us, it's, it, it, and we all carry those blind spots in our hearts and in our lives because this is what it means to be human, is to not be fully aware of, of the totality of who we are. But what does Jesus do with those misconceptions that we carry into the world. Well, if, if we are truly his disciples, and if Jesus truly cares about us, 
then he is going to take us on a process of crisis. So first, we, like Peter, begin with misconceptions. Second, God allows a crisis of truth to reveal to us who we really are. So let's stop and consider this, this, this phrase, is that God allows a crisis of truth to reveal to us who we really are. Have you ever experienced a crisis of truth where, where you're going along and just kind of assuming that everyone thinks about you the same way that you think about yourself? That you go around assuming that the things that you're doing or the work that you're doing is being, is being received in the same way as you perceive it as you express your life, your work, your words, your relationships, whatever it may be. And then one day somebody calls you out on something that you did not expect to be called out on. Have you ever had that experience where, where you feel where someone maybe reproves you? And you kind of feel taken aback like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that that was how you saw what was happening. I didn't realize that my words were coming across in that way. Sometimes we experience a crisis of truth when somebody speaks to us and tells us something that we are doing that may, not, may have been received differently than how we intended. Other times we may experience a crisis of truth at a larger scale. But at the end of the day, what we must realize is in our relationship with Jesus, Jesus allows us to experience a crisis of truth for the sake of revealing to us who we really are. He wants to, he wants to um, unburden us of our misconceptions because he knows that it's the only way towards true intimacy with him. Now, the word there, crisis, in the Greek is translated as krisis. And if you look at the book of Revelation in the, the three angels message, what you're going to read there is a, a message of judgment where the Bible says the hour of God's judgment has come. And what's so interesting is that the same Greek word that's used for judgment is the word krisis. And so essentially what we see here is that a crisis of truth is the, is the same word that's used for judgment. And what is the purpose of a judgment? The purpose of a judgment, that word krisis, um, also can be the connotation there in the ancient Greek is a separation. And so this is why Jesus illustrates the judgment as a separating of the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the chaff. And so what we see here is a crisis is essentially taking two things that are intertwined and separating them for the purpose of revealing what is true about that thing. In, in, the, in the judgment scene, we see the true wheat being separated from the chaff. We see the sheep being separated from the goats, the, those on the left hand being separated from those on the right hand. And so essentially that is what judgment is. It is the process by which what is inside of us is revealed and separated. And so this is the judgment scene at a large scale. But I'd like to suggest to us today that every day is an opportunity for us to experience a mini crisis of truth in which God separates and reveals who we really are from our pretense, our misconceptions, our masks, the things that we set up as a way to protect ourselves from truly being exposed. And so Jesus allows this crisis of truth in the life of Peter, and he allows the crisis of truth in our lives as well. Now, was this the first time that Jesus ever revealed to, to Peter a crisis of truth when he was denying Jesus? No. What we see is that all throughout Jesus and Peter's interaction, Peter was trying, Jesus was trying to get Peter to become more self-aware. Um, one example of a crisis of truth, um, we all know the story well when, when Jesus is walking on water and when Peter says, if that's really you, bid me to come out. And, P and Jesus says, come to me. And you see that Peter steps on the water. 
And as he's walking on the water, we're told in the Desire of Ages that he felt a certain sense of self-confidence, of pride welling up within him, that he was doing something that the other disciples were not strong enough or faithful enough to do. And so we see that, that Peter turns back and he, sets, and he takes a glance at his disciples and kind of maybe gives them a little, a little nod of pride. And as he turns back to look to Jesus, a wave comes in between them and he loses sight of Jesus. And the moment he loses sight of Jesus, Peter begins to sink. And as Peter is sinking there in the storm and in the waves, he, he feels hopeless and lost and about to drown. And, when, and as soon as he says, Lord, save me, Jesus reaches out his hand and pulls Peter up out of the water. And the Desire of Ages says that had Peter learned the lesson of the night on the lake, he would not have failed when the great crisis came to his life. And so what we see is that the way that Jesus worked with Peter was that he allowed Peter to experience crises that were of less magnitude, where the stakes weren't so high. And he wanted him to learn those lessons so that when the great test came, he would be prepared. But Peter, like myself and many of us, failed to learn the lessons of the small crisis, which made the great crisis ever more difficult. So just to recap, we all begin with misconceptions about ourselves, about Jesus, about the world around us, about the, the church and, and the kingdom of God. And sometimes God allows a crisis of truth to reveal to us who we really are. And I don't know how many of you have experienced a crisis of truth this week, maybe in the way you've related to friends or family members, maybe in someone calling you out on, on, on something that you are not, have not been doing, maybe, maybe a crisis in your relationship with God where you all of a sudden feel completely disconnected. Well, Jesus says that he allows a crisis of truth for what purpose? To reveal to us who we really are. And we see in the story of Peter that he experienced this crisis of truth shortly after he promised that he would never deny Jesus. You know how the story goes, and, and I'd just like to share with you some, some of the missteps that Peter took leading up to that great crisis of truth. The first misstep is when, as they were walking to the, to the Mount of Olives, and, G, and Peter had said, if everyone denies you, I will not, even if I have to die for you. And then Jesus leads them up the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he takes Peter, James, and John apart with him. And he takes them to that spot where Jesus prayed. And he, and he leaves them there and he says, watch and pray with me and for me. And then Jesus goes and we know that last prayer in John chapter 17 where he is pleading with God. And then he comes back to his disciples, Peter, James, and John, who he had asked to watch and pray, and we find that he, they are all asleep. And so we see that one of the first missteps that, that Peter took is that he did not take Jesus' words seriously. He took himself very seriously when he said, I would rather die than dishonor you. And while Peter was claiming that he would, he would be willing to die for Jesus, he could barely even stay awake for Jesus. And the reason he couldn't stay awake for Jesus is because he, in his mind, justified himself by saying, oh, I'll, it's just a little nap. It's just a little sleep. It's no big deal. It's not like, you know, Jesus is asking me to, to fight against the Roman guard. I will do that willingly and readily. But now he's just asking me to do a little thing, and this little thing must not be of such great consequence. And I would suggest to us today that, that often we are like Peter in that we are willing to do great and mighty things for God. But when Jesus asks us to do things that, that seem to us to be small and insignificant like pray, we take those commands and those requests and those urgings from the Holy Spirit for granted. And so what happens then? What happens is Peter is setting himself up by failing to do the little things. 
So the next thing that, that happens is we know that after Jesus is praying that the Roman guards come and Judas betrays him. And what does, what does Peter do? He takes out the sword, he cuts off the ear. And then as Jesus is telling him not to do that, and as Jesus heals that, that Roman soldier, as Jesus is being led away, all of the disciples run away. But then the Bible says that Peter followed Jesus from afar. In other words, Peter was not willing to be arrested, but he still wanted to follow Jesus. And so the way that, Je that Peter decided to follow Jesus was from a distance. So the first mistake that Peter made that night is that he, that he slept when he should have been praying. The second mistake that Peter made that night is that he followed Jesus from afar. And I think that sometimes this describes many of us is that we want to follow Jesus, but we're not willing to be too overexposed or too, um, or, or too persecuted. So we follow Jesus, but we follow him from a distance so that if something goes bad, if something goes wrong, we could have plausible deniability. This is what Peter does is, is he wants to follow Jesus, but he doesn't want to follow him close enough to expose himself to possible harm. And I think sometimes we follow Jesus secretly. We follow him from afar, but because we're afraid of being ridiculed maybe by our friends or our coworkers, we don't, we don't really wear Jesus on our sleeve. When, when, someone, when, we're, when we're in conversations, maybe we don't bring up the fact that Jesus is the heart and center of our lives. Maybe we speak in, in, in platitudes or maybe we speak in vague moral language, but maybe we follow Jesus from a distance like Peter did. The third mistake that Peter, did, that Peter made is that he assumed that he could mingle among the multitude and not be revealed. Peter, I imagine, maybe put a cloak over his head and he, the Bible says that he went and gathered around the fire outside of the courtyard where Jesus was being put on trial. And so as he followed from a distance, he, he probably covered himself and he sat down by this fire and he was listening without being exposed to what was happening in the proceedings in the courtyard. And as Peter was sitting there, assuming that he would not be noticed, somebody looked at him and said, you were with Jesus. And then they heard the way he spoke and he said, you speak like someone who was with Jesus. And what does Peter do? He says, I do not know what you're talking about. I don't know that man. You see, but, but there's something about Peter, and I think it says the same thing about us. When you have been with Jesus, people will notice. Even when you're trying to deny it, even when you're trying to follow from afar, when you have been with Jesus, it changes you fundamentally. And I think that this is the same when, when someone is wandering from God and wandering from Jesus and they decide that they're going to go and explore other things. That even when you have wandered from Jesus, if you have spent any significant time with him, when you go into other settings, people notice that there's something off. There's something you strike a dissonant chord in the, in the courts of non-believers. As much as you try and hide it, sometimes you just, you just can't catch the rhythm of unbelievers in their presence, in their conversations, in that room when you have been with Jesus. And the same thing happened with Peter. As much as he tried to disguise himself, his presence alone struck a discordant note around that fire. And, and, and when he was exposed as a follower of Jesus, he did everything he could to convince the people otherwise. Ultimately, he said, all right, if this is what it takes, I am going to curse and I'm going to use as much foul language as possible to prove to you that I do not know the man. And the Bible says that as soon as that third time that Peter denied Jesus with cursing, the moment as soon as he finished Cursing Jesus, he heard the rooster crow. And when he heard the rooster crow, the Bible says he turned 
and looked at Jesus. And Jesus was looking right back at him. The Desire of Ages says that at that moment, Peter experienced that crisis of truth where everything that he pretended he was from a faithful follower of Jesus one minute to a non-follower of Jesus the other minute, everything about him, all of his defense mechanisms, all, all of his pretense, all of his masks were in one moment at the sound of one rooster were completely dismantled. And he stood there in that courtyard with Jesus' eyes fixed on him, completely naked and exposed to, to, he, to who he really was. And the Bible says that in that moment, Peter ran from that courtyard. The Desire of Ages says that as Peter was running blindly through the streets, feeling completely overwhelmed and exposed, I imagine his heart was racing. He was probably having some sort of a mental breakdown, some sort of a panic attack as he was running through the streets of Jerusalem. The Desire of Ages says he began to ran, run up the Mount of Olives, and finally when he couldn't run no further, he found himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, at the same spot where Jesus had prayed. And the Desire of Ages goes on to say that he fell on his feet, on his knees, and he wished that he would die. That exposure of his true self was so, was so traumatic that Peter wished that he would die because, because everything that he had built had crumbled around him when he was exposed, when he inflicted upon himself this great and terrible wound. And then the Desire of Ages goes on to say that when Jesus looked at Peter that night, when he denied him for the third time, and when he heard the rooster crow, and when his, when his gaze turned to Jesus, what he saw in the eyes of Jesus, what he saw in the look of Jesus, was sorrow and pity. But the Desire of Ages says that there was no anger there. Have you ever heard the phrase, if looks could kill? What if looks could save? You see, when Peter looked in the eyes of Jesus, Jesus was justified in looking at Peter with that look that you give your children when they're acting up. Or that look that you received from your parents every time you were making noise or snickering in church. You know the look that I'm talking about. It's the death stare. It's that look that says, you better pull your act together or there will be consequences. Or sometimes it's that look that says, I'm so disappointed in you. And sometimes a look is enough to make someone's heart filled with dread or filled with shame or, or, or filled with, 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 with embarrassment. But what the Bible says is that when Jesus looked at Peter, there was no anger there. There was sorrow and there was pity or sympathy for Peter. But it was ultimately a look of love. And when Peter found himself alone in that garden, overwhelmed by his self-inflicted wound, it was the look that Jesus gave Peter that saved his life. Because as he was contemplating that look, as he was contemplating those eyes of love and mercy, he was reminded of what Jesus told Peter right after he claimed that he would never leave him. What did Jesus tell Peter? In Luke chapter 22, the Bible tells us that when Peter claimed this great, unfailing, undying, God-like love for Jesus, that Jesus looked to Peter and he said, Simon, Simon, the devil has desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. 
And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Now, in the moment, Peter was so caught up. He was so, he was so, um, uh, he was, he was so caught up in his own proclamation that he probably didn't truly hear what Jesus was saying. But when he was in the garden on his face, ready to, to, to breathe his last breath, he was reminded that Jesus said to him, listen, the devil wants to do a number on you in the face of your failure. But I want you to know this, that I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Now in that phrase of Jesus, in that word from Jesus to Peter, this is what we discover. The first thing we discover is that Jesus knew how Peter would fail him. And Jesus knew that when Peter failed him, that the devil would try to rub salt in that wound. And so here's the word that Jesus had for Peter is the same word that Jesus has for you and me today. Is that Jesus knows our weaknesses. Jesus understands our short-sightedness. Jesus knows that we carry misconceptions. He understands the areas of our life that are unsanctified and unrefined and self-serving. And Jesus knows that in order for us to come to healing, he has to allow those things to be exposed. The other thing that Jesus knows is that when those things are exposed, the devil is going to try to take advantage of that exposure. The devil is going to try to rub salt in that wound. The devil is going to try to open that wound, and he wants it to hurt so bad that we lose our will to live. That's the devil's job. That's his role. That's his, that's his modus operandi is to get us to come to a point of such desperation that we no longer will to live anymore. This is why Peter, Jesus said, Peter, Peter, the devil has longed to sift you as wheat. In other words, he wants to shake you so bad that you want to just give up. How has the devil been sifting you as wheat this week or this month or this year? In what ways has the devil been trying to pour salt in the wounds of your brokenness? Pour salt in the wounds of your failure? How has the devil been trying to accuse and discourage you this week? Jesus knows your weakness, and Jesus knows that the enemy is seeking to destroy you. But then he says this, But I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. Brothers and sisters, I want to share with you today that in the same way that Jesus prayed for Peter, Jesus has prayed for you. Isn't that good news? Is that Jesus Christ himself has prayed and is praying for you. And what is he praying? Jesus is not praying that may they never make a mistake. Jesus isn't praying that may they be full of shame until they finally get their act together. Jesus is praying this, Lord, I pray that their faith will not fail in the, in the, in the sight of their brokenness. But not only does Jesus pray that our faith not fail, Jesus has faith on our behalf. Because then Jesus said to Peter, when you are converted strengthen your brethren. He doesn't say if you are converted. He says when you are converted. And so this is, this is the, the third thing that we see about Jesus as it relates to Peter is that Jesus believed in Peter. Jesus believed, had faith, had confidence in the, in the work that was to be completed in the life of Peter. And he spoke that word by faith. He said, when you are converted. You see, this is something that I think is hard for us to, to accept. And that is this. Jesus believes in you. Jesus believes in me. 
Even in the moment of our greatest darkness, our greatest failure, our greatest confusion, our greatest worry, Jesus believes in you. The question for us today is this, do I believe in Jesus' belief in me? Do you believe in Jesus' belief in you? And so what we see here is that like Peter, we all begin with misconceptions about ourselves. God allows a crisis of truth to reveal to us who we really are. And then in the presence of Jesus, we are offered an epiphany to get us on the path to healing. In the presence of Jesus, we are offered an epiphany to get us on the path towards healing. And what is the epiphany that Jesus wants every discouraged believer to experience. I believe that the epiphany that Jesus wants every discouraged believer to experience is this, you are not what you have done. You are not what you have done. You see, this is the difference between, between godly sorrow and ungodly shame. Godly sorrow says, I have done something wrong. Let me come to the feet of Jesus. But ungodly shame says, I am what I have done wrong, and therefore I can never come to Jesus. I'd like to read to you a portion of an article from um, Jennifer Schwerzer, who is a Uh, a a psychologist, a Christian psychologist who's done a lot of ministry. She's, She's an Adventist out of Orlando, and she wrote the following. She says, studies have revealed that there are two reactions to wrongdoing, a shame based reaction and a guilt based reaction. The researchers pointed out that shame prone people tend to globalize wrongdoing to their entire person. In contrast, the guilt-prone person can feel remorse for a wrong done without lapsing into self-loathing. They can differentiate between self and behavior, effectively saying, I was mistaken, but that does not make me a mistake. And the shame-guilt difference extends beyond self-image to relationships. Specifically, the shame-prone person has more defenses and insecurity in their relationships, but the guilt-prone tend to have secure, trusting relationships. The study says says that guilt-proneness involves a working model of self that is humble about personal limitations. Shame-proneness involves a more narcissistic working model of self. Let's see if this research fits the Christian experience. As sinners, we know both guilt and shame. We feel guilt for what we do and shame for what we are. Guilt is the appropriate and healthy response to wrongdoing and can, through empathy for one's harmed, blossom into soul-cleansing repentance, confession, restitution, and ultimately healing. Shame while accurately reflective of our sinful state, can present complications. Unresolved shame tends to cause us to fold into ourselves, developing a narcissistic working model of self that ultimately leads us to think badly of ourselves and others and compromises our ability to trust. Do you see the irony in the fact that self-loathing can actually lead to narcissism? Many have confused shame with humility, but shame handled apart from God actually adheres us to our own wounded egos in a kind of introverted pride. Shame handled with God is a different story. Or to be more precise, shame taken to God is a different story. The truth is our sins flow out of a corrupt nature, Left to ourselves, we are, indeed, we are indeed seethed with corruption. As Daniel brokenly prayed, to you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. Yes, 
Shame belongs to us, but shame surrendered to Jesus, who bore the cross, despising the shame, can actually become his opportunity to reconstruct our self-respect on a more sure foundation. In that sacred moment of soul bearing, Jesus whispers, in me, you are a new creature. This sin does not define you, I do. And so the epiphany that Jesus wants each and every one of us to experience is that we are not what we have done. Our sin does not define us when we encounter Jesus. And notice here how Jesus brings Peter along this path of healing. Finally, when we experience that epiphany, Jesus calls us to offer this gift to others. And so we find ourselves back where we started today. You see, after, Je- after Peter had rejected Jesus, denied Jesus, he was struggling with shame. He was filled with shame. Even after the crucifixion and the resurrection, and, and even after Jesus revealed himself to his disciples in the upper room, Peter was still filled with a kind of, of guilt and, and, and shame and self-loathing. So much so that, that while they were waiting for Jesus to come and reveal himself to them again, Peter was so discouraged that he said to his disciples in John chapter 21, I'm going fishing. And the disciples said, we're going too. And so we find Peter in, chap- in John chapter 21 in the very same place where his entire discipleship journey began, which was casting a net into the sea. And the Bible says that, that when Jesus came and revealed himself to them, that Peter saw Jesus and he jumped into the water and he swam to Jesus. And when he found Jesus there on shore, he had prepared for them breakfast. And after they had finished eating breakfast, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, let's go take a walk together. The Bible says that, that as Jesus and Peter were walking together, I can imagine that Peter is still feeling a sense of deep shame and sorrow for what he had done. And in the midst of this walk, Jesus asks Peter these three questions. The first, as he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now, what we have to understand is that this this interaction is so much better understood in the original language. Because in the original language, what Jesus asks Peter is this, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? And what we have to understand is that in the, the Greek language, there are more than one words for love. And so in this, in this word, agape, we find the ultimate form of godly love. Agape is the kind of love that says, I would rather die than dishonor you. You see, agape is the kind of love that Peter professed for Jesus in that walk to the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, if everyone denies you, I won't deny you. If I have to die with you, I'll never leave you. And so now you have Jesus and Peter on a walk again by the shore this time. And Jesus says to Peter, remember that time when we were walking and you told me that you would rather die than dishonor you? So I want to ask you today, Peter, do you agape me? And what's interesting is that when Jesus replied, when Peter replied, Peter said this. He said, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And so Jesus asked Peter if he agaped him, which is the godly self-sacrificial Jesus love. And when Peter answered, he said, Jesus, you, you've seen the real me. And the real me is this, is I thought that I agaped you. I thought that I would rather die than dishonor you. But today I must admit that my love for you is limited. And so what Peter uses to express his love for Jesus is the, is the Greek word phileo, which is brotherly love. And so, so Peter now, after he has been exposed, after he has experienced the crisis of truth, has a more humble self-perception about his limitations. And so, so he says, I understand now that my love for you is limited to this. And I'm not going to pretend like it's anything else. 
Jesus, you know, I know that you know that I don't agape you the way I thought I did. But here's what I do know is, is I'm offering you this limited phileo love. The Bible goes on to say that Jesus again asked him the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? And now, now Peter is starting to feel maybe a little bit uncomfortable. He answered, he said, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. So here you have the second time Jesus asking the same exact question and maybe trying to get Peter to, to respond. Or maybe Peter feels like Jesus is testing him to be like, you know, are you truly aware? Are you truly humbled? And so Peter the second time says, Lord, you know the truth. The truth is I don't agape you. You know that I phileo you. And then the third time Jesus asked, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And the third time that Jesus asked, he didn't say, do you agape me? But the third time in the original language, Jesus said, do you phileo you, phileo me? In other words, now Jesus is asking him, do you really have that brotherly love that you just claimed you had for me? And the Bible says that Peter was hurt. Why was Peter hurt? Peter was hurt because the third time Jesus asked him, do you phileo me? Now, why do you think that hurt Peter? Well, the reason that hurt Peter is because Peter had just been trying to explain to Jesus that his love for him is truly limited. It's not what it thought it was. And so he said, this is the most I can offer you. And now the third time Jesus says, do you really phileo me? And so it says that Peter was hurt. He was distraught. And then finally he, he says, all right, Jesus, this is me. This is all of me. I am, I, am, I am completely naked before you. I have no more pretense. I have, I have no more pride. I'm not pretending. I'm not, wearing, I'm not wearing any kind of costume or mask. I am not pretending to be someone who I'm not. I am now aware of the reality of my limitations that I thought I loved you a certain way. I thought I was a certain kind of follower. I thought I was a certain kind of disciple. But now I realize that all I have to offer you is this limited, broken, imperfect kind of love. It's all I have to give. And here it is. Look, search me. Know who I am, God. This is all that I have to offer you. And I know that it's not enough. And then Jesus looked in the eyes of Peter again and he said, that's all I ever wanted. I never wanted you to be someone who you were not. I never wanted you to put on a pretense just so people would think that you're special. All I ever wanted was the real you. And now that I have it, you are on the true path towards healing. And in that moment, Jesus passes the baton to Peter. And he says to him, now you are truly ready to feed my sheep. Now you are truly ready to feed my lambs. And then Jesus says to Peter, there will come a time when you will die for me. And that is how you will know that you have truly become a wounded healer just like me. And so today, friends, the gift that Jesus gave to Peter, the epiphany that Peter experienced of God's unfailing love of Jesus's confidence and trust and faithfulness to Peter, even in the midst of his greatest self-inflicted wound, is the same gift that Jesus wants to offer you and I today. It's the gift of the wounded healer. Because here's the reality, each and every one of us carry wounds in our souls. Some of them are more obvious than others. Some of them are so well hidden that we ourselves don't even see them. But Jesus says this, if you truly want to be an agent of healing in this world, the only way to do it is to be a wounded healer. Henry now in his book, The Wounded Healer, says the following, unless we become wounded healers, we will be unhealed wounders. 
In other words, unless we as a church accept this process of exposure, accept this process of humility, accept this process of healing, instead of offering healing to the world, we will only further do damage if we are inhibited by pride. But also, this message for us today is this, is that shame has no place in your life today because when you stand in the presence of Jesus, he will unburden you of shame. Because when Jesus sees you, he does not see you as he does not see you as what you have done, but he identifies you by the love that he has for you. And so today if you are weighed down with a burden of shame, if you feel like you have become so identified with your failure, that you have lost the will to go on, either to live or to do ministry or to be a Christian, today Jesus is saying to you to this, the devil has sought to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Let us pray. Our precious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the gift of the wounded healer. We thank you, Jesus, that that you have come to offer that gift to each and every one of us today. And so I want to pray for anyone in the sound of my voice who maybe, like Peter, has experienced a crisis of truth. And we know, Lord, today that we are living in the last days. We are living in a time of investigative judgment where you are allowing us to experience so many of the crises in the world around us so that we may come to grips with what truly defines us. And I pray today, Father, that we will not allow ourselves to be defined by anything other than the fact that we are precious, chosen sons and daughters of God, that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I pray, Father, that this is what will identify us to the world, that as you heal us from our wounds, that as we reveal our scars, that we would not relate to them by shame, but that we would relate to them as signs of victory. Because you have taken us from a long way off, and you have brought us into the very heart of Jesus. And I pray today, Father, that we would so identify with that love, that we would so identify with that mercy and grace that when the world sees us, they too would be drawn to the one who showed us everything that we have ever done. This is my prayer, and I ask that it would be our experience because I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Just as we close, I want to encourage you Um, to tune in to something that's taking place this weekend by Light Bearers Ministry. Um, They have put out the Arise training program. They're doing an online convocation on the end times, and it's called The End. And I'm going to add the link here at the end of this uh, in the comment section here for you to tune into that um, convocation, and I'll put it on our Facebook page as well. Um, It's a lot of solid biblical stuff, and I believe their next... um, Their next live will be taking place at 2 p.m. our time. And so I'll put that on the description and I'll add it to our Facebook page as well. God bless you. Thank you all so much. Stay cool out there in this heat and looking forward to seeing you and worshiping with you again. God bless.